As I was getting up early, I like to read again the chapters so I understand the context of what I'm preaching on. So I read through the latter books of Exodus, Exodus 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, to get a better understanding. And though I've read it numerous times, I just wanted to refresh my spirit. So 2.30 in the morning, which was now 3.30, but really 2.30 because of the time change, I began to read. As I began to read, I, I read in the 33rd chapter, I believe it is, where it said, and Moses spoke with God face to face. And then just a few verses down from that, the Bible gives us this, which I just read to you that said, no man hath seen God face to face and lived. And because I know the Bible is inspired by God, the Holy Spirit, then I know that there cannot be error or fallacy in the pages of Scripture. So I began to say, Lord, I've studied commentaries. I've researched it. But God, I really need you to tell me what you meant there. And I felt like in, in contrast or rather in, in uh, cooperation with the... Uh, those who have studied this text before me, I found that when the Bible said they, that Moses communicated with God face to face, it was not so much a literal face to face experience because we already have evidence that no man can do that and live. And so I said, God, what, what does it mean then to have that statement in the Bible? And it came back to me and in my research and in my prayer that it was simply that it was the most intimate time with God in the Hebrew language, in the Hebrew dialect. It really signifies that it was the most intimate time between Moses and between God. The words face to face were not spe specifically almost said that in another language, specifically talking about a physical encounter. It was talking about an intimate relationship. And the story that I just read to you is a direct reflection of this hunger in the heart of Moses to want to know God more. And dealing with the people that are so hard-hearted and stubborn and stiff-necked, by God's own definition, he describes these people as that. See, some people think that God loved the children of Israel so much that he said, I'm going to come down and I'm going to release them from the prison and the captivity of Egypt and I'm going to set them free because I love them so much. That's not why God released the children of Israel. It is true that he loved them. But God loves every one of us. God did not break the bonds of captivity on the children of Israel for 400 and some years in Egyptian bondage because he loved them. He broke the bonds of Egyptian captivity upon the children of Israel because he's a covenant keeping God. And long before they ever got set free from Israel, Egypt, long before they ever walked out of that bondage, God had made a covenant with Abraham. And he said, thy descendants shall be. Whenever God says shall be, you can take it right to the bank and cash the check. When God said your descendants shall be as the stars of the heaven and as the sands of the sea. So the book of Exodus Although by name it really describes a book of exiting out of. It is not even so much a book portraying the story of the exodus of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. As much as it is describing 
the hunger in Moses' life for the presence of God. See, the problem in Egypt with Israel was that they were apostate. They were backslidden. They were faithless. Are you with me? Righteousness has evaded them. They are not, as some would think it to be, this mighty army of men and women of God who are in bondage for 430 years that are worshiping God every day of their life while they're there and praising God in their captivity. And, and, and yes, there's a remnant. Yes, there's a, a, a group of them. But the, the, the overall picture of the children of Israel was that they had lost their faith in God. When you're immersed in iniquity, when you are surrounded by sin, and Egypt, Egypt was a idolatrous, idol-worshipping nation that though they may not have gone to the extreme of the Egyptians, they certainly begun, began to allow that idolatrous spirit to come upon them. And if anything, God, who gets angry, looked down upon them and recognized that they were not where they needed to be. But even still, because of a promise he made with Abraham, he said, I will bring you out of captivity. Aren't you glad this morning for the promise of God? There are some people watching me right now and there are some in this room that are riding on the blessings of God and it has nothing to do with what you did. Some of you think that because you're, you know, you've done something that you prayed before you went to bed last night, that it has invoked the blessing of God upon your life. When the reality is, it might just be that there was someone else long before you ever experienced God's blessing that was calling your name before God, that was speaking your name before the throne of heaven. It may be, I know sometimes we want to take the credit for it, but the reality is that some of the blessings I live in are because I had those who went before me that called my name before God, that lifted my name up before the throne of grace, that said, oh God, let your anointing be upon that young boy. Let the hand of God be upon him. And I can take no credit for some of the things I'm able to do for God because God, you someone long before he ever used me to pray for me to bring my name before God and I'm blessed today not just because I'm a great guy or you're a great person but because somebody called your name before God for those sad sack Christians who always think that everybody hates you You know, we have some of them. Well, nobody likes me. Get over it. And start recognizing that it might just be that there's somebody who really loves you. Quit focusing on who did your wrong song. And start thinking about that you might just be blessed today. Because there's somebody who loves you. You might just be blessed today. Because God set something up of someone's life that believed enough in you, that saw something in you, that prayed for you, hallelujah, that brought you before the throne of God and it activated the covenant promise of God upon your life today. Is there anybody here who knows what I'm talking about? For those who live and ride on the coattails of your godly grandparents those who live and say, my daddy was a man of God. My mama was a praying saint of God. That's a wonderful thing. Because it's evidence that possibly some of the blessings you have are not because of you, but because of those who went before you. And I know maybe that bothers some of you because you say, I thought it was all about me. <laughs> I got news for you. God's not a temporal God. He's an eternal God. 
He's an alpha and he's an omega. He knew the beginning and he knows the end. Hallelujah. And so he doesn't base your blessing just upon what you do. And let me encourage you, don't stop praying. Don't stop blessing and honoring God because there is a blessing comes. But many of us today are the direct recipients. Some of you are in here today that you got set free from alcohol. Some of you are in here today because you got set free from drugs. There are people in this room today that every one of us in this room got set free from sin. We were just like the children of Israel in Egyptian captivity. Are you with me this morning? We were just like them. We were lost. We were discouraged. We were without faith. We had no hope. We were ready to give up. We were ready to throw in the towel. We were ready to give it all up and say no to God and yes to the devil. But God kept his covenant promise and today you are living in the blessing of God not just because of you but because of somebody who went before you here's the problem with the children of Israel because of their unbelief unbelief is one of the most terrible things you can ever live with that's why whatever you're believing God for no matter how ridiculous it might seem, if you share it with me, I will never tell you you're unrealistic. I will never say, oh, you're just a dreamer. That'll never happen. But I will say, if that's what you believe and that's what you feel God has given you in your spirit, then I'm standing with you. My son-in-law, Julian, who's with the children in our kids ministry this morning calling down the fire of God upon them came to me one day and he said dad before I was his dad he said pastor he said I feel one day I'm going to own Disneyland or Disney World or whatever one's here in Orlando I have to be honest for just a millisecond, the flesh took over. And I said, this guy's crackers. <laughs> Until the Lord began to deal with me and said, never ever despise someone's dream. You don't know, and I've said this before, that one day when we get to heaven, Back before some of you may have been born, back before some of you may have been saved, there was a preacher, a faith preacher by the name of Oral Roberts. And Oral Roberts' ministry, tent crusade, miracles, healings, and moves of God were very incredible. And he began to build his ministry over in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And he said one day the Lord told him to build a tower. That tower that God told him to build has been mocked and ridiculed, laughed at, made fun of, scoffed by religious folk, even Christians who said, what a foolish waste of God's money. I've stood by that tower. I've looked at it as it spirals into the sky. I've talked to people who have been in the prayer center of that tower. And it was built with the purpose that it might lift up prayers 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks of every year forever, as long as it's there. And I thought about that for a moment and I said, wouldn't it be interesting that one day when we get to heaven, that we look over our left shoulder and standing behind us on the clouds of glory is a tower that is the exact size, shape, and form as the one that Dr. Oral Roberts built in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I, I want to tell you something, church, this morning. That when God begins to speak, we need to be quick to listen to the voice of God. When unbelief creeps into our hearts, unbelief hear me this morning, is what kept the children of Israel out of the promise of God. The promise of God was a covenant promise. I will bless thee. 
I will make thy descendants as the stars of the heaven, the sand of the sea. What an incredible promise from God. And yet every single kid, person, man, woman, boy, girl who came out of Egypt died in the wilderness. Except for two. And the Bible says it was because of their unbelief. They did not believe. I don't know how you could not believe. I don't know how. I don't know how you could just come out of captivity and, and, and see God feed you with manna every day from heaven. I, I don't know how you couldn't believe that. I don't know how you couldn't believe that when water flowed from a rock that it's the provision of God. I wish I had some help here this morning. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know how you could not believe that God who put a pillar of fire before them through the night and led them through uh, their traversing of the wilderness. I don't know how you couldn't believe. I don't know how a cloud by day wouldn't rest over the heads of the children of Israel as they made their way toward the promised land. I don't know how. I don't know how much more convincing it would have taken. I don't know why they needed such proof when God had already given supernatural evidence that we are the generation that God has raised us up to another level because he says blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe hallelujah somebody give God a hand of praise what's it gonna take what is it gonna take to convince us of the provision the providential hand of God how much more do I need to part a Red Sea do I need to shut the mouths of lions? Do I need to give you supernatural strength? Do I need to plant a stone in the forehead of a giant? What do I need to do? That you might see me as God, Jehovah, Jaira, Moses. I know my time is gone. Moses was convinced. But I think he came to the place where he said... God, because you know, when, when, when God saw what Aaron did and, and formed and fashioned a golden calf and the people began to do what is in their hearts to do. Do you understand? From the, the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In their heart was not God. God was not the center of their life. They just went through the motions. They just did all the religious things. They knew when to clap their hands. They knew when to lift their hands. They memorized the words of the songs. But in their heart was a golden calf idolatry. Inside of their heart was a spirit that lusted after other gods. And this was not Egypt. This was not the Amalekites. This was not the Moabites, the Jebusites, the Midianites. This was the children of Israel who had seen the divine demonstration of God. And yet still, in the absence of their pastor, for just a few days he went up on the mountain, just a, just a quick little getaway. Received from God the law, the Ten Commandments. Only to come down and see the revelry. For a, a moment they thought it was the music of war and victory celebrations. But as they got closer, they soon realized that it was an ungodly wicked party where they danced around a golden calf. If you read the scriptures, it will tell you that it was Aaron who took out an engraving tool and he formed and he fashioned that calf. And as you read it later on, it will say, and the calf just dissolved and they threw the remnants into the water and the children of Israel were made to drink of that water. And Moses uh, I'll preach the message another time because I can't even get to it. And Moses, because God wanted to annihilate them again. 
I repent that I've even made mankind as it was in the days of Noah. And, and here again, he said, uh, this wicked, idolatrous generation, he says, I'm fed up with them. If it wasn't for the covenant with their father, father grandfather Abraham, great, great, great grandfather. If it wasn't for that promise, I'd wipe them off the face of the earth. But when God makes covenant promise with you and I, you can run and you can hide and you can cheat and you can steal and you can do all of those things. But there is a covenant promise of God that said, if you will hearken unto the voice of the Lord this day, hallelujah, that that promise will be activated not only then, but in your life and my life today. And so they died in the wilderness. I need to just close with this. I feel like I'm ripping you off. You see, Moses was not like them. Moses talked to God face to face. Moses had an intimate relationship with God. Oh, he's talking to the church today. That's what God's saying. This is what God's saying. He's saying, I'm talking to your church. He said, I'm talking to your choir. He said, I'm talking to your preachers. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to your deacons. I'm talking to your elders. I'm talking to your parking people. I'm talking to you this morning. God's talking to us. He's talking. And here's what he's saying. He's saying, there is a remnant. Moses was a type of Christ. He jumped in the middle and said, please, God, don't kill them. That's what Jesus did for you and I. He became sin who knew no sin. Moses says to God, he says, I, he says, I have, I have, I have wearied myself. I have worked and I have labored. And I, like you too, I'm also frustrated with these people. So forget about them for just a moment and show me your glory. God, I'm not responsible anymore for them. I just want you. You see, that's what speaking face to face with God. The holiness of God is so beyond our understanding. And church, can I tell you this morning, we cannot mess with it. That's why I can't stand religion. And I don't like some denominations. I just love God. I'm tired of the devil's way to divide. And Moses finally came to the place where he said, God, he said, I, I, I saw what you saw. I smashed those tablets because like you, I was angry. And thank you that you're going to give me a... Uh, not a second chance. He's not the God of a second chance. If he was the God of a second chance, we'd all be dead. He's the God of another chance. Hallelujah. And he said, God, he said, I, I don't care about that right now, but I have to see your glory. God said, it's too great for you. If you see it, if you see me, if you see me face to face, you'll die. You can't, no man can see me and live. So God says, but here's what I'll do. I'll pick you up and put you in the cleft of a rock. And I'll place you there and I'll put my hand over you. And he said, when I pass by, I will move my hand for just a moment so you can see the back parts of me, but you can't see my face. Because if you see my face, you'll die. All Moses wanted was to not be like those who had lost their faith in Egypt. He said, God, I don't want to be that. 
I want to be, I want to, I know God's speaking to some people this morning. He's calling you to be a Moses this morning. He's calling you out. He's calling you out of that Egyptian bondage, bondage mentality. And he's saying, I'm calling you in to be a Moses. He's looking for young men and young women. I'm telling you, we are on the edge. We're at, in a, there's a precipice we're standing. And he's looking for men and women who are ready to jump and leap and say, God, it's all God or nothing at all. It's all you or nothing.